This is the video podcast from First Christian Church of Kokomo, Indiana for February 16, 2020. Our services are Sunday morning at 9.30. Normally, we are scattered throughout our community trying to live out the way of Jesus. We hope that you will find these words encouraging and meaningful. Today, Rev. Eric Brotheridge gives his thoughts on Evolve for God's Sake. I'm reading from the 104th Psalm taken from the New Revised Standard Version. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot, and you ride on the wings of the wind. You make the wind your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundations so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they flee. At the sound of your thunder they take to flight. And they rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys, to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. By streams the birds of the air have their habitation, and they sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use, to bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has its home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, and the rocks are for the refuge of the conies. You have made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness, and it is night, when all the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. People go out to their work and to their labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. I rejoice it's no longer Gordon and I holding down the bass section. Larry has returned. Thank you, Larry. Bye. Okay. Guess they're doing baby shower stuff. I don't know. Hmm. Did you catch verse 2 of that wonderful reading of the 104th Psalm by Arlene? Thank you, Arlene. That was poetry listening to that. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. King James translates it as you stretch out the heavens like a skin, like how you would dry an animal skin. Did you catch other references to the order of creation in there? How the waters were above the mountains and God separated the waters. This is an ancient understanding of how the universe was shaped back then. Waters were above waters below, and God separated all those waters in creation. Did you hear about the pillars, the foundations of the earth? Of course, back then, most folks believed the earth was flat and was held up by four pillars, north, south, east, west. 
And that's reflected in the psalm attributed to King David writing. It's verses like those that I've just shared and many other verses in Scripture that the church for thousands of years has used to maintain its scientific perspective that the earth was flat, the waters were above, hell was below, God was above that the earth was located at the center of the universe, that the earth at the center meant that the sun and the moon revolved around the earth. That's the ancient view of the created order. Well, today is Evolution Sunday. Why in the world am I preaching on the theory of evolution on this Sunday? Is it biblical? Well, I don't know, let's find out. It's a good question. And believe it or not, I think it's the most important question facing the church, the capital C church today. Why? Short answer. Because the way we talk about God needs to continue to evolve. And when our God talk has not evolved, more and more people view the church as meaningless and irrelevant. Surprise, surprise. But first, why Evolution Sunday? I shared with the email conversation group this past Monday that I joined what is known as the Clergy Letter Project when it started in the year 2005. The Clergy Letter Project is made up of thousands of religious leaders, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, whose goal is to simply proclaim from the pulpit the following statement. Faith and science are compatible. There, sermon's done. I did my work. In other words, this is not science. This, thank you, Jan, for the donation of this science textbook. Oh, she disappeared. This is not faith. And I can place both of these on my bookshelf side by side. I grew up and went to church never even hearing nor considering the idea that Scripture was science. It was foreign to the culture I grew up in. It was not an issue then, and it's not an issue now for me. In fact, I remember being stunned as a young boy when I learned that Galileo was condemned to be burned at the stake by the church because he saw through his telescope that, well, the earth was a revolving around the sun. <coughs> How could this be? I remember thinking. The very idea of the Scopes trial, 1925, where the Tennessee law against teaching evolution in school was challenged, seemed absurd to me. But just so you know that I'm not taking sides by holding faith over science or science over faith, I find it also fairly ridiculous that scientists use science to argue against faith. That's just as silly too, in my mind. Maybe, 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 hopefully, please, God, hear my prayer. This argument will be settled. Until that time, I stand by the words of one of the greatest and most formative of church fathers, St. Augustine of Hippo, who in the 14th, 14th, 4th century, wrote a book called On Genesis. 1,600 years ago, Augustine, the seminal thinker in the Christian faith, saw the problem of people using Scripture to make scientific declarations. What he writes was brilliant for his time, 
brilliant for today in this age-old argument between science and faith. He writes, Usually, even a non-Christian knows something about the earth, the heavens, and other elements of this world, about the motion and orbit of the stars, and even their size and relative positions, about the predictable eclipses of the sun and moon, the cycles of the years and seasons, about the kinds of animals, shrubs, stones, and so forth. And this knowledge they hold to as being certain from reason and experience. Now, and this is Augustine talking to the church, it is disgraceful and dangerous thing for a non-Christian to hear a Christian presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture talking nonsense on these topics. And we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation in which people show up vast ignorance in a Christian and then laugh it scornfully. Augustine goes on, the shame is not so much that an ignorant individual is derided, but that people outside the household of Christian faith think our sacred writers held such opinions. And to the great loss of those for whose salvation we toil, the writers of our scripture are criticized and rejected as unlearned authors. In summary, here is what Augustine was saying 1,600 years ago. This is not this. 1,600 years ago. And when we say we are, they are, we look ridiculous and make our scripture look ridiculous as well. A quick aside, did you know that theology used to be called the Queen of Sciences? What a lovely title, the Queen of Sciences. Those were the days. Highly paid professional theologians were the scientists of the day. Dissenters be burned. Oh, how I long for those glory days where clergy had power. Even though faith is not science and science is not faith, it must be admitted that our theology does shape our science and our science does shape our theology. Can't get away from that. They're in conversation. Have you ever thought about Jesus as a radical theological scientist? A Charles Darwin of theological evolution? Consider the accepted scientific understanding of God in Jesus' time. God was the first cause that set everything in motion, separated the waters so that earth could be created. God then removed God's self from the created order and lived in the heavens. Access to this removed God was mediated in temples by religious authorities. Imagine the response of the scientific theological authorities when along comes a person proclaiming the reign of God is near and at hand. This mad scientist then goes on to call this God Abba, Papa, or Father. As if this God was not sitting on the heavenly throne where some, where any self-respecting creator would sit, but that this God was strolling arm in arm in our midst with us. Sounds like a theological evolutionary understanding of God that deserves for that person to be crucified, yes? How dare you change how we think about God? 
quite an evolutionary change in theology. I would suggest it would even work well today. Imagine how a conversation might go with a non-Christian of today if instead of starting with the billboard, repent, avoid hell, trust Jesus, we begin with, I love seeing how God is with you. There's a big difference. Ever since my first memory as a little child, I've been in a long walk with God and having conversations with God about the nature of God. God, what are you? God, what are you? Sure, for many years I had not framed the ongoing conversation in my head as a theological conversation. I thought the conversation was just a bunch of voices jabbering on about this, that, and the other. And no, I don't believe I was, nor I, nor I am now, psychotic, prone to hearing those types of voices in my head. In other words, like most people, I was just going about the business of my ordinary, routine, daily life chatting with God. And then one day I was building a sand castle in the sandbox with my oldest daughter, Corinne. She was about five and had gone to preschool at the church where we attended. And out of the blue, she asks, Daddy, why is God a boy? What? Five years old. Daddy, why is God a boy? What? Where did you... I know where you picked that up. My goodness. And those theological conversations I had had only in my head up to that point became a public quest. A quest where I talked with anybody and everybody about all things related to God. I entered seminary. <laughs> And I quickly learned that the very fact that I ask the question, when have you encountered God? Or do you believe in God? Or what is God to you? Or even saying, let me tell you a story about God and Jesus. That all of these things presuppose that they have any relevance to the person that I might be in conversation with. With that person that's hearing me going, what are you talking about? A metaphor for what I'm talking about. It's like a stranger who belongs to the religion of jelly belly belly, uh, jelly beans. You familiar with that religion? Neither am I. But it's like a stranger who belongs to the religion of jelly belly jelly beans coming up to me and asking, when did you last eat a tutti fruity jelly be belly? What? The question presupposes, one, that I know what a tutti fruity jelly belly jelly bean is. Two, that I would eat a tutti fruity jelly belly jelly bean. And three, that in eating a tutti fruity jelly belly jelly bean, whew, this is a mouthful, that the experience should now become the sole and only lens by which I should live my life. After all, that pale pink jelly belly jelly bean with little polka dots is now in my belly, having sacrificed itself, its little sugary body, just for me. I think you have an inkling about where I may be going with this and what that metaphor may mean. All of the religious stuff, the doctrine, the ritual, the introit, the prelude, the postlude, the songs we sing, the table we gather around, the communion, the, uh, the faith that we sing in our songs. All of this makes sense to us, right? 
All of this makes sense to those who are a part of this body of Christ. To someone who knows nothing about God or Christ, our way of life is strange, very strange, and not very compelling. Our challenge is to make our life strangely compelling. Strangely compelling. Study after study shows the decline of organized religion in our culture. It's no surprise. We know it well. It's happening here in the Kokomo area. I've had countless conversations over the years with people who have left churches. I love it when I encounter people who have left churches. Of course, the first question is, why did you leave? They tell me and I go, it makes perfect sense to me. They give many reasons. All of them are good. I firmly believe that human beings are rational decision makers. At least that's what I wrote prior to this week. After what I've gone through this week, I'm not quite so sure that human beings are rational decision makers. You're doing what? That makes no sense. But that's my story. One choice is obvious. People will not even listen to our church, to a church, that doesn't honor science in this day and age. That I do know, and that I've heard over and over again. Other choices are not so obvious, at least to church people like us looking out, seeing all these people that aren't in church on Sunday morning, who don't know Jesus Christ, who have stepped away from the life of the body of Christ for whatever reason. For example, did you know that attendance at children's soccer games on Sunday morning make perfect sense? I hear that a lot in talking with people on, you know, why people aren't here. Well, they've got soccer games, they've got this, and they've got that. It makes perfect sense to me why they're not here. They're watching their kids play something that the kids enjoy. Is that not the most powerful thing you can do as a parent? And I think God likes that. In those stands, there's a sense of community amongst the family of fans. Is that not a wonderful thing to be in? There's a participation in something greater than yourself, the game that your child is enjoying and playing. There's refreshments. There's excitements. And I think best of all, you get to yell and scream at the referee. Try that on the pastor at church. And that's just one example. Our challenge is to make our way of life, the way of life of being a part of the body of Christ, compelling, strangely compelling. I believe an evolution is needed in how we think about church and how we talk about God. Those are conversations that are down the line. And I am excited. One of my seminary professors 20 years ago said, there is no better time than now to be church. There is no better time than now to be church. We have room for people in our body. And I'm not talking about room in the pews. Well, okay, Eric, give us something to do and think about. Think about this one word, encounter. Encounter. Do this one something. Encounter another person with your reverse offering and share the story. Encounter another person with your offering of God's love. 
The upcoming season of Lent is about encountering the lectionary scriptures for Lenten season come from the Gospel of John and are all about Jesus encountering the other. It starts out with that wonderful first encounter of Jesus with Satan in the wilderness. Then with Nicodemus, the Pharisee. With the woman at the well. With the man born blind. And finally, with the dead man, Lazarus. And in our Lenten study, we will encounter those characters in Les Miserables, Jean Valjean, Inspector Javert, Fantine, Cosette, and Marius. That starts the first Sunday in Lent. Encounter, 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 encounter the other. For I firmly believe that it is only in encountering the other where we encounter God. And I'll close by repeating that. I firmly believe that it is only by encountering the other where we encounter God. Amen.